Good morning and welcome to Calvary Assembly. How many of you guys are excited to be here at Family Fun Day? Can you give a clap of praise and excitement this morning? We are so excited that you have come here today for Family Fun Day. This morning, we are going to worship God. And so you might see some people raising their hands. They're simply extending a hand towards heaven and saying, we thank you, God, for all that you have done for us. But what we want you to know is that no matter where you're at on your faith journey, whether you're a believer or not, this is a safe place for you. You are welcome here and you belong here. And we are just thankful and grateful that you have come today. We're gonna have a service. It'll be about an hour long. And after that, we are gonna eat some delicious barbecue, which we are also excited about. But would you stand to your feet right now? We are going to worship. We are gonna praise because he is worthy and he is worth it. Let's join together. Come on, let's sing. This is the day. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name. And now your joy awaits my praise. Come on, let's make a declaration. I give thanks for all you. down, he brought me out and set my feet on higher ground. Come on, let's sing this testimony. So here I stand, you run my God, your faithfulness, my solid rock. in the sanctuary this morning. Let's invite the presence of the Lord to fill this place today. Come on. Good morning. 
How many are glad it's not snowing today? Yeah, it's just, <laughs> you never know around here. And for all of those of you who wore jerseys other than Buffalo Bills, we will have a repentance service at the end and we will leave the baptismal open, but we are cooling it off for you, just so you know. Hey, listen, it's great to see each and every one of you. Please have a seat this morning. There comes a moment in a person's spiritual life when they want to not just think a thing or hold it in their heads or their heart. They want to act on it. Jesus understood how incredibly important this was, so he calls us to something called water baptism. It's the moment that our faith takes action, and we start a journey of following him because he's the one who led the way into the waters of baptism, and we follow him in it. So this morning, we have some folks that are going to be baptized in water. And you should know we do not consider this a solemn occasion. We consider this a celebration. When someone decides to put action to their faith and to their beliefs, we think that's something worth celebrating. So when they burst fresh from the waters of baptism, let's just lift up a cheer, letting heaven and them know how pleased we are of the steps that they are taking this morning. Hi, I'm Christina Poria, and today I want to get baptized today. As a child, I grew up in a Christian home, strongly encouraged by my whole family. Last year, I decided I wanted to accept God into my heart and that I wanted to pursue Him. Today, I want to get baptized today because I want to take that next step in my faith, and I want to share this moment with all of you. Well, Christina, um, I'm so excited for the new step that you're taking. Um, the greatest thing I've seen for you is just the confidence in your new identity that you have in Jesus, and you walk in that, and you're continuing to grow in that, so I'm so excited for the new opportunity that you have here. So, because you put your faith in Jesus, and because you promised to follow him for the rest of the days of your life, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hello, my name is Vanessa Gansler. I've been going to Calvary for a little over eight years. My entire family goes here. Um, I want to get baptized because I want to give God thanks for everything I have in my life. Um, he's the one that's given me the dedication and the drive to achieve everything I have in my life. And in return, I'd like to be baptized in his name and give God the glory for everything I have in my life. so grateful that the early days of your life, first days of your life, were marked by dedicating you to the Lord. Now you've come to the place where you want to make a decision for yourself to follow him for all the days of your life. So because you've placed your faith in Christ, and because you've committed to following him all the days of your life, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name is Jonathan Behage. Um, my journey kind of started with me being a heavy atheist. <laughs> and then um, I met a really, really good friend and me and her kind of went back and forth a little bit. And um, then I started actually looking into the idea of Christianity uh, late last year. And then through actually looking into it, I found so many truths and was just blown away. So probably in like February-ish, I decided that this is, this is what I want to do with my life and this is what I want to believe and follow. Um, I'm not a very like publicly showy person. I've never done like, gotten any awards or anything, but this is something that I want to actually make public and show people like, hey, I believe in God, I want to live my life for Him, and I want everyone to see that. About a year and a half ago, there was a knock at our door, and about a half dozen kids were standing outside. And as I answered the door, I hear 
Now you, this is a Christian home, watch your language. I don't know which one of them said it, but John was in the group. And it's been such a great privilege to watch John grow from, from doubter to skeptic to believer. And so John, based on your confession of faith and your desire to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Hi, my name is Doug Davies. Uh, I've been attending Calvary Assembly uh, with my wife Melissa and two children, uh, Windsor and Walker, for almost a year and a half now. Uh, I was blessed to be raised in a Christian household. Um, the church that I attended uh, when I was growing up didn't believe in water baptisms, uh, just baptism by the Holy Spirit. Um, and since attending Calvary, uh, I've witnessed multiple water baptisms, and it's something I've prayed about. It's something that I want to do uh, as a public declaration um, to show my love and relationship with uh, Jesus. Well, Doug, because you, you are a man who cares deeply about your family, who cares deeply about serving others, and so today, because you have placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, and you have committed to follow him all the days of your life, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hi, my name is Aaron, and during my life I've had a lot of ups and downs, but today I'm choosing to be baptized because two reasons, because I want to regain my trust in Jesus Christ, and I would like to, I want to change my life around. <laughs> you want me to take your glasses? Oh, yeah. Here, Melissa. Aaron, you are somebody who has already experienced many ups and downs, but what you need to always know and always remember is that Jesus is always with you. He will never leave you and never forsake you. No matter what you go through, no matter what you walk through, he loves you and he smiles upon his child. So because you have decided to place your trust in Jesus and commit to follow him all the days of your life, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The goodness of God is something to be celebrated. Amen. Why don't we stand? We're going to respond. And this is part of why we say God is moving around us. He's changing our hearts. He's filling this place with his goodness and his grace. So let's just take some time to acknowledge who he is. Before we sing, just take a moment to quiet your heart and just thank him for how good he's been. Jesus Christ, 
my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages steps down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Come on, this is good. The cross has broken. I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior. I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hey, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. Because death couldn't hold my Jesus, the grave can't hold me anymore. Because death couldn't keep my Jesus from rising, the grave can't hold me anymore. So press into his power, press into his love, press into his goodness. <laughs> Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on. Church, this is what we're going to do this morning. We're going to sing that verse again. And maybe you feel like you're not feeling the victory of Jesus in your life this morning. But we're gonna press in. We're gonna declare these words from the depth of our bones today. Declare that he has triumphed over the grave. Declare that the grave cannot hold us anymore because Jesus is alive. Come on. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Raise your voice. Your buried body. Hallelujah. 
exalt the name. This morning before we head into um, this next song of worship, um, I just want to share a little something that God has been placing on my heart recently. Um, this next song talks a lot about peace and stillness and God um, causing just the shadows to tremble, the darkness to tremble. And I know that I just feel like there's people in this room who maybe haven't experienced that true peace in a long time or maybe not in forever. And um, as I was just preparing um, for this morning, um, the story um, that came to mind that's in the Bible of um, the disciples and Jesus and they're in the boat together and all of a sudden out of nowhere this terrifying storm comes and the waves are rocking the boat and the, the, the disciples are afraid and rightfully so but they're, they're, they're upset because they're like where is God? Where is Jesus? He's not showing up in this situation. We've seen you do miracles they've you know been side by side with Jesus and he's not doing anything in this situation and their lives are at stake and they're like God where are you and they're crying out to him and later they find him and he was sleeping on the boat during this chaos and I just I, this picture in my mind came to me of the eye of the storm if you've heard of it the eye of the storm is a place of calm there's chaos all around, but in that eye, there is this peace and there's this assuredness. And that is who Jesus is for us. He is the eye in the midst of our storm. And even though there is chaos all around us, our circumstances and people that we can't control, he is that peace and he is that safe place. And so as we sing this song um, this morning, I just want you to just... Pray that over your life if you are experiencing this chaos and you you long for that peace. I just want you to pray this song over your life and over your circumstances and um, let Jesus be that peace that only he can provide. Um, and you will just experience peace like none other. Let's sing this morning. Jesus, Jesus. 
I'll stand with these arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. And I'll stand with my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours, Lord, I will stand, and I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned. I'm in awe of the one who gave it all, and I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you, sir. Come on, church. This is not a sad song. This is a song of victory. Get ready to lift your voice this morning. Get ready to praise him for who he is, the savior, the deliverer, the giver of every good gift. Come on, lift your voice. Oh, and I'll stand. Come on, church, lift your voice. Yeah. Good morning. I work as an electrician part-time, and I had a job one time where I had to put a ladder up to a second-story house in order to get up there and, and, and work. And we put this ladder up, and it, it was actually icy that day, and the ladder was sitting on a deck. I was like, well, I think we'll be okay. I think this is going to be fine. You can probably see where this is going. But I climbed up the ladder. And I was working up there. I was up there for a few minutes when all of a sudden I felt the ladder move and it started to shake. And in that moment, my, my stomach drops. I'm fearful. I'm scared for my life. And this ladder completely comes out from underneath me. And in that moment, I grab onto the gutter. I'm hanging 20 feet in the air, holding onto the gutter. And it's like in the cartoons. I can see the nails like pulling out of the gutter as I'm like, oh, Lord, this is not good. So I was able to pull myself onto the roof and get to safety. But I think that a lot of times that in our lives, we will put our ladder of our lives or even our lives onto things that cannot sustain us. We will put our lives onto things that cannot hold us, but we will trust our lives with those things. Whether it be our success, our family, what other people think of us, the approval of other people, and we put our trust and our hope in those things and we, we reach out but those things can never hold us. But the most amazing thing about who Jesus is is that we can rest in him, we can stand on him, and even though our knees can tremble, he's not going to move. So that's why we're here today. We believe that. We believe that he will not move. It doesn't matter who you are, he will not move. So let's go to God in prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you're here. We thank you that you're with us. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives and for the hope that you have offered us. We praise your name, Jesus, in your name. Amen. You guys can grab a seat, take a seat. And I am living proof that we're not just all Bills fans around here. New York Giants fans, where you at? All right, all right. Don't, don't let Pastor Bob discourage you. Pa Giants fans are welcome here. But I just want to uh, thank you guys all for coming out today. If this is your first time here with us, we just want to uh, just give you an extra thank you for coming out. Um, right here, you'll see these red cards on your seat. If you guys all just want to take a moment to grab this, and what this is, you can fill out your information at the bottom, and all this is is a way for us to thank you for coming. If you have prayer requests that you would love to pray for, you'd be able to fill that out right in the back. And here's what I'm going to say. Hold on to that little card. It rips off. It's peripherated. Hold on to that card, and at the end, Pastor Bob is actually going to have a time for you to fill out some of the other things on this card, and then you can put it into the offering tray as it goes by. 
So as we do, as you guys are filling that out, I'm going to give Steve the microphone here, and he's going to explain Kids Release. Oh, good morning. Our, uh, I have a few instructions for kids and youth. Youth are going to be staying right here in the tent during service. Uh, kids will be heading into the building, and we have kind of a unique setup this morning. If you have kids up through kindergarten age, they're going to be in our normal kids' hallway. And instead of using just three of the classrooms there, they're going to be using all five classrooms. So uh, pick up your, your kids might be in a different classroom than usual. Uh, grades one through three are going to be meeting in the auditorium, and grades four through six will be meeting on the lower level in the youth room. And when we release kids here in just a moment, we've got a team of volunteers who are holding up signs out on the parking lot so kids can head out there or parents, you can drop off your kids there. They'll bring them all the way in safely into the building and help with that transition. Uh, if your kids do not have a, have not checked in yet, it's very important that they check in and get a name tag sticker, uh, especially if you're a first time guest. And if they've never done that before, we have a family welcome team right inside the lobby who can help you get plugged in and, and get a check in uh, sticker for your kid. And you'll need that again for pickup at the end. And the last thing I wanted to share was that uh, the beginning of September here and, and today is our official launch for our SOAR ministry. And SOAR is our ministry for kids with special needs. And we are so excited. Uh, we want to be able to minister to each and every child who comes here. And we have an amazing team all ready to invest in kids with special needs. And if you'd like to find out more information about that, you can check out the website, rcalvary.org forward slash kids. And with that, we're going to release kids. Good morning. This morning we have had a call from Chick-fil-A and Colonel Sanders wanting to know what happened to all of their chickens. <laughs> we had to uh, sacrifice a lot of chickens for this group here today. And uh, we're thrilled that you're here. As you can tell, our church family continues to grow. And we're so grateful for that. What we've discovered is, is that people really are interested in spiritual things. They really are interested in God. They really are interested in truth that transforms their lives. And so we've had a, a wonderful experience in our church family of just con continuing to see our church family grow. That means that our current facility is getting a little bit challenging to be able to navigate some of that growth. So we have some really incredible plans to be able to expand our facilities in a way that allows us to have more space for assemblies like this, as well as some uh, children's space, increase our lobby space for all the good donuts and coffee we enjoy every, every week. And so uh, you're going to be hearing more about that. I just wanted you to be aware there's some important meetings coming up in the month of October. And uh, if you would like to hear more about those plans or an opportunity to ask some questions, uh, all you have to do is plan on showing up to one of those meetings, and we're just going to, to share long before we do anything, we want to talk and have a conversation about it, so you're welcome to join us. Uh, this morning, I'm, I'm starting a, a series called The Key That Opens Every Door. The Key That Opens Every Door. And there's one verse I'd like us to look at real quickly, and uh, it's Jesus speaking, and he said, 
when you stand praying, if you hold, what's the next word? <laughs> you don't have that memorized? <laughs> when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, would you just, I, I, I will lead up to that, and then you can just say anything against anyone, all right? So, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, listen to what he says, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. What's fascinating is that the context of the passage is actually one where Jesus is talking about the kind of prayer that can do impossible things, like move mountains. Like These kinds of prayers can transform our world in ways that, that are beyond our imagination. And so we're surprised when he moves right from this mountain-moving prayer that, that changes impossible things to possible things. The first thing he talks about is forgiveness. He's not changing the subject. He's continuing on the theme. And the truth is, is that there are a lot of things that seem impossible for us today. There are doors that seem closed. There are, there are things that seem like it will never happen in our lifetime. And Jesus wants us to know that what could be keeping us from being able to experience that possibility and move those mountains might be unforgiveness. Now, forgiveness is actually a Christian idea. And, and if you're sitting there and you're not completely subscribed to the Christian faith, you might be saying, excuse me, Pastor, you're uninformed. Lots of religions teach religion. And I would completely agree with you. Lots of teachings, lots of religions teach religion or teach forgiveness. I, I know that's true. But the only religion that says that if you have anything against anyone, forgive them. No other religion says that. Buddhism says that you can forgive because evil is just an illusion. So it's not real, therefore you don't have to work up any uh, frustration against it. Islam and Judaism teaches that if your enemy repents and asks for forgiveness, you should always extend it. But the only religion in the world that just that says, no matter who, no matter what, you forgive, that's a Jesus idea. Jesus insists, not only should we do that, but we should do that before we have their permission to do so or their request to do so. Some of us have been waiting a long time for someone to come and ask us, will you forgive me? And if you are waiting for that person to show up in order to forgive someone, you might wait the rest of your life. So Jesus says you don't have to wait for permission to give. There are people that have done things in our lives or said things in our lives that caused a great deal of pain to us. And it leaves kind of a wound. And in ways, because of unforgiveness, we wind up trapped in the past. We never really move past it. And the result is because we're unable to forgive in the present, we wind up sacrificing our future. Our unforgiveness of what someone did against us in the past now controls us. The only way I know to break free from that is through forgiveness. And I know it's, it's you'll hear a lot of conversation in our culture today that says, you just need to recognize that they were wrong or that they were mistaken, and that's enough. And what I will tell you is, it's not. You can realize they were wrong, and they were mistaken, and still feel wounded. The only way I know to heal those wounds and be able to move into the possibilities that God has for you in life is to learn how to forgive. What you'll discover is that forgiveness is hard. Can everybody just say that with me? Forgiveness is hard. Anyone who doesn't think so has never had a serious wrong committed against you. Because if it's ever, if something significant has ever been done to you, you know it's really hard. Now, when we have wronged others, we assume forgiveness is easy. Like if I did something to you, I might just say, come on, forgive me. Just get over it. It's not a big deal. Move on. And, and sounds easy when it's for you. But if you do something against me, I'll go, yeah, that's, it, that's not that easy. And so we have to find a way to, to work through what forgiveness is 
And to do that, we have to kind of understand the components of unforgiveness. What's at the root of unforgiveness? And the first thing that's at the root of unforgiveness is our pride. Our pride. Now, this is counterintuitive. We're surprised by this. Because if we are unforgiving, we have to cling to a belief. A belief that if we were in that person's situation, we would never have done to them what they did to us. That means that we're actually a better person than they are. They are lesser than, and we are better than. And in order to not forgive them, we have to cling to the idea in that situation, I would have behaved better than they did. Here's what you need to know. All the great evils of the world start with a single concept that someone is lesser than me and I am better than them. Once you've crossed that bridge, you can do anything to anyone. It's one of the most dangerous things that ever happens in our world. So all that's needed is just to, to cling to that pride. The truth is, we don't know the situation that they were in. We don't know what they were struggling with. We don't know what pain they were enduring. We don't know what pressure that they were under. We don't know what we would have done in their situation. It's very easy to assume we would have done better. Maybe you would have done worse. Maybe. Just smile and look at the person next to you and say, you might have done worse. Just tell them. Yeah. You have to smile when you say it or you'll... Some of you are saying more than that. <laughs> You're adding on or piling on, as the case may be. So our pride is one of the, the, the foundation stones of unforgiveness. But there's another thing, and it's poverty. Our poverty is a foundation stone of unforgiveness. You probably saw here today, we've got cars parked everywhere, just everywhere. And so let's suppose that as you're leaving here today, you back out of your parking space and you bump into my car and you break the taillight. And I know you're an honest person and you would just come right to me and say, Pastor Bob, I bumped into your car and I broke your taillight. Now, I've got a couple of options to exercise. I could look at you and I could just say, you know what? Not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Now, here's the thing. I can't leave that taillight unrepaired or unreplaced because I will get tickets. I know it's happened to me. So I have to replace that. I have to repair that. But if I'm telling you not to worry about it, what I'm saying is I will pay for it. Not a big deal. Now, I, I will tell you what will be a deciding factor about that. The deciding factor will be how much money I have in the bank. Right? So if I have lots of money, just lots of money, like when my wife wants to buy something and I ask her, how much money do we have? She says, oh, we're rolling in it. <laughs> and then when I want to buy something, she says, oh, we need to tighten things up just a little bit. <laughs> I've noticed this. And so, so let's just suppose that, that, that I, go, I go and I've got all this money and I can say to you, fine, I'll pay it. The price still has to be paid, or otherwise I'm going to get tickets, but I'm choosing to pay the price because I've got more than enough. But let's suppose that I'm going through a really difficult season financially. Let's suppose I actually don't have enough money to be able to repair and replace the light bulb. And let's suppose that I am concerned that I will get tickets, for which there are always fines. And maybe they will even raise my insurance rates. And so what you have done, I can't afford. And so I would come to you and I would say to you, you know, I'm not able to pay that price. And after all, you did break it. And so I'm asking you to pay for the repair and the replacement of that taillight. And why am I making that decision? Because I don't have enough money to cover it. See, we can be forgiving when we have more than enough. What I'd like you to know is that this isn't just a thing that works for money situations. It works for non-money situations too. For example, let's suppose that someone says something that makes you look bad in front of other people. 
I'm sure that hasn't happened to anybody here, but it's happened to lots of people. Someone says something that makes you look bad, and you have an opportunity either to forgive them or not forgive them, and your decision is largely going to be based on whether you think that people already have a good opinion of you. That, that the people around, they know you well enough that they just look at that person and go, yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. I know this person. So if you've got a lot in the, in te- in the identity bank, people know who you really are. If you've got a lot in the identity bank, then you're not worried about it. You just ignore it. You, you can forgive that person. But if you're a little bit fragile and insecure about your identity, if you haven't had the opportunity to establish and substantiate to other people who you really are, that's going to be a problem for you. And because your identity bank is running low on funds, what you want them to do is pay back. You have to pay that back. Or, or suppose someone says something that lessens your reputation. They, they say something that sounds like you, you cheated in some way or you cut corners. There's, there's a character issue in your life. If the people around you know lots about your character and that you're a strong person and you've got lots of currency in your character bank, then you don't have any problem just saying, you know what, that person doesn't know who I am and, and these other people do and I'm not worried about it. But if you haven't been able to establish that reputation or let's suppose you're actually trying to recover from a bad reputation, you've, you're turning your life around. You're trying to get better and someone's remembering something from a long time ago. That's a really painful thing. And if you don't have a lot in your relationship bank, you will want that person to pay back and probably with interest. Or suppose you're dating someone. And, and the person you're dating, you're hoping this turns into a lifelong, lasting, committed relationship. That's what you're in this for. And then they come along and disclose to you, that's not how they feel about this relationship. And they're going to, they're going to start creating some distance, maintaining their own identity and freedom. And some people get very frustrated about that. And they will, this is what they'll say. They'll say things like this. You have wasted my time, or even this, you have stolen years of my life. And then they'll say this. They, they add to it. You have taken the best years of my life. And what are they saying? They're, they're giving you very important information. What they're telling you is that they're low in their currency of relationship building, and they think that if they are not at the prime of their life, they will never have a great relationship. And you just took the best opportunity they had away from them. And boy, are they going to make you pay. That's how our world actually works. All of these scenarios reveal poverty either in identity or in reputation or relationship, and there's lots more issues than that. So... At the root of our unforgiveness is pride. I assume I would have done better than you and poverty. I don't have enough to pay that debt and you need to pay it. So the question becomes, how do we learn how to forgive? And the first answer is going to surprise you a little bit. You have to name the wrong committed and condemn it. I know, you're surprised. Name the wrong committed and condemn it. And you're probably sitting there going, wait, 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 wait. I thought this was like a Christian thing and there's grace. And what's the naming the wrong and condemning it? If you can't identify something is wrong, it doesn't need to be forgiven. Well, if, if, if you just understood. No, if you can understand, you don't need to forgive. You just need to understand. Forgiveness and understanding are not the same thing. See, now we're uncomfortable doing this. It actually feels awkward to us to do this. We believe a better strategy is to try to minimize what they did against us. To say it wasn't that bad, it wasn't that big a deal. And here's the challenge. You need to know that when we do that, it's a form of lying. And you cannot get to freedom by speaking lies. You cannot make yourself stronger by trying to make less of the things that were done to you or against you. It's not how it actually works. Jesus is relentlessly committed to the truth. He never asks us to pretend anything. So it has to be named. Name it. They lied to me. Name it. They took advantage of me. They abused me. They hurt me. And it was wrong. And I don't deserve it. That's the first step in being able to forgive. 
The second step is this. Act before you feel like it. Act before you feel like it. If you wait until you feel like forgiving, you're probably not going to forgive. Um, our culture basically says that if we're saying we're forgiving, but we don't feel forgiving, that we're not authentic, that, that we're not being real. And that's simply not true. Uh, we can choose to live life by our feelings. I don't recommend it. Uh, as a rule, that doesn't go so well. Feelings make better byproducts of actions than deciders of actions. You don't want to put your feelings in, in control of your decision making. That, that rarely goes well. So there's lots of things we don't feel like doing. If, if you're in college, you probably don't feel like doing the reading assigned for the class. So I don't feel like it. Okay, how are you going to feel when you fail the test? <laughs> you're going to feel like a failure. That's how you're going to feel. And then, and then you're going to be frustrated and anxious, and, and you're going to have to tell your parents if, 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 if you actually do that. Maybe you have a way to, to hide that. And so you, you feel like a failure. But if you decide, I don't feel like doing the reading, but I will do the reading, then when you take the test, you feel more confident going in, and you feel better coming out. I don't feel like working out. I have never felt like working out. <laughs> have you heard about a runner's high? It's a lie. <laughs> I have run until I've had cramps in both sides. I've blown out two knees. Not one euphoric moment. Not one. <laughs> My heart was better for it. My knees were not. So, so you, don't feel like we're, you don't feel like getting with your friends. I'm just tired. I, I, I don't have the energy. But if you don't get with your friends, relationships begin to get distant, and you start feeling isolated. I don't feel like going to work. Okay. See how that goes for you. Because if you don't show up, they won't pay you. That's just how it is. And so we wind up, if we let our feelings control our actions, then our situations get worse, and so do our feelings. But if we're willing to act before we feel something, we can not only change the outcome, we can change our feelings afterwards. So feelings can add a lot to your life, but they shouldn't be deciding your life. The next step is to respond in love. So remember, name the evil committed against you and condemn it. Act before you feel like it. And then respond in love. Now, this is where people get a little frustrated and they say, you know what? People do really bad things. And that this idea of forgiveness, you're just letting evil people off the hook. You're letting them get away with it. You, you, you've, you've covered this all up with religion, and so bad people do bad things, and innocent people are victimized, and, and religion is supporting it through this idea of forgiveness. And I'd like to challenge that thinking. Forgiveness actually does not require us to ignore justice. In fact, forgiveness requires us to act towards justice. Uh, if you actually love a person, by the way, let's just eliminate some of our feelings about that. Remember we just talked about feelings? You won't always feel the love. Any parents in the room? Any parents in the room who had a child that threw a tantrum that you hope to God nobody else saw? <laughs> when they were laying on the floor kicking and screaming and saying words that you don't know where they learned? <laughs> did you look at them and you could say, I just feel the love right now? <laughs> if you did, you were being sarcastic. And sarcasm is a form of anger, just so you know. So, no. It's not about the feeling. How do you feel towards the person? It's that you want the best for that person. That's what love is. I want the best for you. So if you're the kind of person that thinks like this, I can't forgive you because I want justice, what you should know is, what's actually true is, you can't forgive and you don't want justice. You want vengeance. And there's a difference. You can get justice with forgiving, but you can't get vengeance with forgiving. Forgiveness is just deciding, I will absorb the pain and I will not try to hurt the person back. See, when someone hurts you, you want to hurt them back. Here's the problem. 
We want them to experience the same pain we felt, except it's never the same pain. Right? If, if you've been around uh, communities of faith for very long, you've probably heard a passage in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Anybody heard that? The problem is, so you could say, okay, that's justice. All right. But the problem is we never do an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If they poke us in the eye, we poke them in the eye and we break their nose. <laughs> Let that be a lesson to you. You touch me, it's going to be worse for you. You know, They knock out our tooth, we break their jaw and take all their teeth. And say, Let that be a lesson to you. Our, our world actually says you have to do that in order to maintain respect and to keep people from taking advantage of you. And what the Bible says is when you try to pay back the pain, when you impose it on other people, what actually happens is you impose more on them than they imposed on you. And guess what they are going to do? Yeah. We shouldn't be surprised. This is what's happening in our world. All the time, conflicts all over the world. Well, they did this to me, and now I'm going to do this to them. And then the other side says, well, they did this to me, and I'm going to... And it never stops. It never stops. Love is a commitment to want what is best for the other person. So the only way we can, and we can really forgive is to want what's best for the other person. Now, here's the thing, and, and I will tell you, this is actually true. Another person, if they experience enough pain, you will forgive them. Oh, I've seen this. I've been in lots of emergency rooms and lots of intensive care units and lots of hospice rooms where the person who is in pain and on a bed and probably won't survive the event has done terrible things against people. Terrible things against people that they've never been able to forgive. And then when they see this racked, destroyed, emaciated body that's about to give up life, they'll look at them and the, something inside will go, that's enough pain. And then they'll be able to forgive. This is how our world works. We demand pain in order to be able to forgive. And that's why there's so much conflict in our world. So forgiveness is actually more about justice than vengeance. And you can actually hold a person accountable and love them. Why do you hold them accountable? Not to hurt them back, but you hold them accountable so that they won't do things that are destructive to their own lives or the lives of others. So let's suppose you're in a domestic violence situation. This has happened to a sister of mine. And, and she suffered terribly. And there are people who in religious circles will say, well, you just need to forgive him. And by that, they mean you take no action. And what I would say is you can forgive them and call the police. You're not calling the police so that they feel pain. You're calling the police so that they can stop being the kind of person that destroys themselves and other people in the process. And here's the thing. People can always tell when you're just trying to add pain to their life or you really want what's best for their life. They can tell. And so love actually requires us to call the police. But not so that they can experience pain and embarrassment just like we did but so that they don't have to be that kind of person anymore and they have access to resources that will change them. The last point is this, is to humble yourself. Humble yourself. Our culture actually doesn't operate a lot in grace. Um, for example, uh, this is more common for a younger demographic than I am. You have to realize that uh, when I was in college or high school, there was no such thing as Twitter. Well, there was, but it was something birds did. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a form of social media. Social media didn't exist when I was in high school. If I started telling you all the things that didn't exist when I was in high school, you would know how old I am. And this is a closely guarded secret. So, so. There is someone that will post something when they're 16 years old. I mean, really, the frontal cortex of their brain hasn't even fully developed. They don't even know what they're saying. And then 10 years down the road when they're 26 and they're about to apply for a job or they've made it into media circles in some way where now they've got some kind of celebrity status, people will go back and do the research and they'll find that quote 
And now they want that person destroyed, and they want that person fired, and they, they want that person done away with, because look at what they said. And what is, what is our culture telling us? If you've ever thought that thought, if you've ever spoken like that, that's who you are. You're that. See, there's no grace there. There's no opportunity for growth. There's no transformation. There's no opportunity to change your views or your mind. You're identified by your worst moments in our world. That's what our culture does. And our culture says that when things like that are happening, you have to assert yourself and you have to demand your rights. And if you don't do that, then people are just going to define you and there's going to be nothing left of you. And then comes Christianity where it says that the goal in Christianity is actually to serve other people so that they can become what God hoped and dreamed for them. Our fear is, our fear is, is that if I'm helping others become what God intended for them, I will become less. This idea of humbling ourselves is hard. So there's this great passage in Philippians chapter 2. This is what it says. In your relationships with one another, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is a fascinating passage of Scripture because it tells us Jesus humbled himself. He didn't tap out in the crucifixion. Like, that's the time, right? That's the moment you stop playing the humble servant role is when, when people are cursing you and torturing you and trying to destroy your body in the most painful way imaginable. That's the moment where he could find the excuse to stop serving, right? But he doesn't. And as a result of his continuing to serve, even in those circumstances, to continue to humble himself, even in those circumstances, we have now the capacity and the, the avenue to reconnect with God and his grace. We can connect with him because Jesus was a humble servant even through the cross. And then it tells us that because of that, Jesus didn't have to exalt himself because he was willing to be a humble servant and not tap out, that God exalted him. You can either try to exalt yourself or you can let God do that. Those are the choices we make in life. But when we let God do it, God is the one who gets the credit and the glory for it. And what's true is there's a part of our heart, we want the credit and we want the glory. We're the ones who earned it, and that's what we want. So the reason we can't forgive is because something is broken inside of us. The reason we can't forgive is because something is broken inside of us. The sin against us did not make us unable to forgive. It's the sin in us that makes us unable to forgive. And I know there's some people right now in this room that are just saying, Pastor, you don't know what was done to me. And you're right, I don't. And if I heard about it, I would be, I would be heartbroken over it. But what I'm telling you is, your inability to forgive is not based on what was done to you. It's what's inside of you. The reason we have trouble accepting forgiveness from God is because we don't think we're that bad. What do I need? It is highly offensive to, to tell anyone you need God's forgiveness. Forgiveness for what? And that's because we have no idea of all the ways we have broken the heart of God. All we focus on is the rules of God. And so God's heart is broken. And he 
even when you are nailing him to a cross, offers forgiveness. But we don't believe we're that bad. And not only are we offended that we would need forgiveness because we're not that bad, we are offended if God forgives anybody worse than us. The person who hurt you, for example. What if God forgave them? And that's offensive to us. We don't need it. They don't deserve it, which is why we live in an unforgiving world. But here's what I want you to see. Forgiven people forgive. If you have ever experienced forgiveness yourself, you find the capacity to forgive. I could just end the message today and say, you know what? Name and condemn the evil done against you. Act before you think that it's possible or before you feel like it. Uh, walk humbly. Act in love. And let's all try to do a better job. And what I want you to know is we will all go out of here and we will try and we will fail because there's something broken in us. And the only thing that will fix that is the forgiveness that flows from our Heavenly Father. The grace of God flows into our life and enables us to forgive in ways that we were not able to forgive before. That's the difference. That's what makes the difference. The key that opens every door is giving. But I'm not talking about money. Forgiving is a gift you give someone else. It's a gift that you give. That gift can open doors of possibility into the future that God has planned for you. Let's bow our heads this morning. So we have some wonderful and enjoyable things planned, but I really think we need to take a moment right now and think through the implications of, of what God's Word has shown us today. And so I'm, I'm well aware that there are people who have suffered unbelievably horrible things. And oddly enough, they can happen years and years ago, and the memory of them is as fresh today as the day it happened. And maybe you're waiting for some kind of justice to be done. And what I'm saying is the way to be free from that is not them experiencing pain, but your willingness to forgive. And here's what I know. Until we have experienced the forgiveness of God for ourselves, it's not just that that's hard. It's not possible. We don't have the resources in and of ourselves. I wish we did, but we don't. It's why when you look at the world and, and you see all these hot spots and, and terrorism and conflicts and wars, and, and we just watch on television, why can't they just forgive? Why can't they just make a decision not to do this to each other anymore? Please hear me. They can't. They can't. There's something that they haven't received yet internally. And so this morning, if you've never experienced the forgiveness of God for yourself, I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to lean into that and receive that today because that's the first most important thing that can happen for you to be able to forgive somebody else. I'm not asking you to work harder. I'm asking you to open yourself to a kind of forgiveness that heals what is broken inside of you rather than waiting for someone else to experience the pain. Their pain will not heal you. You might feel that it's just, but it's not the same. So I'm just going to look through the tent today. And if you're willing to make that step today uh, to, to receive that forgiveness for the first time today from God, I just want you to look right at me, and I want you to stay looking at me until I acknowledge you. So I'm going to have to walk around a little bit and step over some stuff. But I'll start over here on the Charlie Avenue side. And if, if you're here today and you're willing to make that decision, just look right at me. And, and as soon as I acknowledge you, you can bow your head. And I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you. That's not why I have you here today. But I, would, I think it's a, it would be an amazing opportunity to open your life to the forgiveness of God. Because this God, you can beat him to death. And he still offers forgiveness because he knows and because he loves. So if you're on this further section over here, 
Just look right at me until I acknowledge you, and then, then you can bow your head again. Just look right at me if you're accepting that forgiveness for the first time today. I see that person. I see that person. I see that person. Just keep looking right at me. I see that person. That person. Thank you. That person. Thank you. That person. Thank you. Anyone else in this section? Just look right at me. That person. Thank you. All right. I'm in the next section over. Just look right at me. Thank you. I see that person. I see that person. Thank you. I see that person. Just keep looking right at me until I acknowledge you. I'll, I'll point right at you, and I won't call you out, but I'll go. I see that person. Thank you. Just keep looking. Just keep looking right at me. Don't give up. This could be an amazing transformation today. I see that person. Thank you. And that person. Thank you. Next section over. Just look right at me. All right, I see that person. Thank you. That person. Thank you. Just keep looking until I acknowledge you. That person, thank you. That person, that person, that person, thank you. Just keep looking. Don't give up. Today is the day unbelievable things happen because of the grace of God and it's your life. I see that person. Just keep looking right at me. That person, thank you. That person, thank you. Just keep looking. Oh, that person too, thank you. I'm over in the next section. Just look right at me. I see that person, thank you. Just keep looking, that person. Just keep looking until I acknowledge you. Thank you, that person, that person, thank you. Just keep looking, that person, thank you. That person, thank you. Next section over. Just look right at me. Okay. That person, thank you. That person, thank you, thank you. That person, that person, thank you. That person, thank you. That person, thank you. Just keep looking. This is the day things become possible that haven't been possible before. I see that person, thank you. Just keep looking. That person, thank you. That person, thank you. Just keep looking. Keep looking. That person, thank you. That person, thank you. Keep looking. Last section over. Just keep looking. Thank you. That person, that person, thank you. That person, thank you. Just keep looking. That person, thank you. Just keep looking. Thank you. I see that person and that person. That person, thank you. Just keep looking. That person, thank you. Just keep looking. That person, thank you. That person, thank you. That person, thank you. Anyone else back there? Heavenly Father, every single person who lifted their eyes today is just simply acknowledging that there's something inside of them that's broken that needs healed, and we need your forgiveness for that to happen. So we just offer our lives. We, we don't know all the ways that we broke your heart, but we're grateful that you were broken for us. And so we look to you to live today. Can you allow the same grace that you operated in on a cross to flow freely into us today to heal the parts of our lives that no longer keep us tied to the past but make unbelievable things possible in our future? I'm so grateful for that. And Father, for people that are in this room today, they've struggled to be able to forgive. Would you help them make a decision that's not based on feelings and it's not based on vengeance? It's just based on the reality that they don't have to live a prisoner of the pain imposed on them. That they can forgive that person today and walk in all kinds of freedom. We thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Can we just say, can we celebrate with heaven this morning on the people who made that commitment today? Let's just thank God for it today. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together.
So I, I know we can feel like it. if that debt isn't paid back, I won't survive it. And it looks like Jesus didn't either, except we just sang the lyric, didn't we? He has risen. Because when you put your trust in God, there's nothing that will be able to destroy you. He has an eternal plan and purpose for your life. And what someone does to you or says about you will not alter that. His voice becomes the most important voice in our lives. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Uh, in your uh, handout, there's a card. And I'm going to ask you to respond to this, kind of like a spiritual survey. And the first one says, yeah, I'm not really interested in Christianity at all. And, and you might ask, why would you put that box on? Well, because we believe we're committed to truth. If you're not, then you're not, and that's fine. You can say that, and you're not going to be treated one ounce different. We're not going to take your chicken dinner away from you today. You're, you still get a chicken, all right? Um, the next box says, I'm, I'm interested, but I'm, I'm not ready to make that decision yet. If that's where you are, we understand that. And the gift we will give you is time. Time to figure it out. Or maybe you're in a place where that's the decision you made today. Just check that box. Because if you do, what we can do is, is send some information to you that will help you start a spiritual journey that's solid. It's, it's not about, you know, how many times you show up in a, a, a religious meeting or how many classes you have to attend. But how do you establish a relationship with God? Those are important things. And so we want to help with that if we can. And then maybe you're already, you're a subscriber to all the grace of God in your life. And we're grateful for that. You can just mark that. We want to give everybody an option to, to be able to check a box today. And then when an offering container goes by, you can just put that in along with your offering. Now, please hear me. If this is your first time with us today, you're under no obligation to put anything into an offering container. Uh, for us, we don't consider giving an obligation. We consider it a privilege. And we don't expect you to come here the first time and support what happened here today. We've already provided this for you, and we've been glad to do that. But what I can tell you is for those of us who've kind of been receivers of grace, we understand this, that there's a lot of people in our world who don't yet know about the forgiveness of God. And what we're able to do is to take resources and use them in a way that make that possible. Like even today, there, there are people who crossed a line of faith and that took some resources to be able to provide this moment, but incredibly worth it, and we're grateful. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for providing forgiveness. You absorbed all the pain of all of our sins, and you will not impose any of it on us. We're so grateful for that. And now you've enabled us to be able to forgive others, and we're grateful for that. And right now we release resources so that even more people can know how good and gracious you really are. In Jesus' name, amen. Fall Ministries are launching this month, and we're so excited for the new opportunities that God is going to bring this year. Here's what's going on. This Wednesday, Second Student Ministries is launching, where students from 7th through 12th grade come from schools from all over to find their purpose, develop relationships, and meet new friends. We have fun games, great messages, and small groups. Come out this Wednesday to find out. Our kids' ministry on Wednesdays looks a little bit different. For our sacred girls, we lean into being creative and relational with the girls. And Brigade Boys is designed for boys. It's active and fun. Kingdom Kids allows us to have interactive and engaging stories and playtime. And then, of course, our nursery offers a loving place for our little ones. Anyways, we hope to see your family there on Wednesday. Outpost College Ministries is going to be starting up a week from today. We're going to be doing a uh, fall semester kickoff. It's going to be a great time where we start to build the community that we really care about at Outpost. It's a great opportunity to meet some of our new leaders as well as get to know the students that you're going to be going through the semester with. So we hope to see you there. Wait, did you guys put the logo over my face again? No, Steven, relax, chill, we're fine. All right, so for you adults, this fall we've got some great opportunities and there's two in particular that I want to highlight for you today. The first is our women's Bible study 
which is going to be happening every other Wednesday right here at Calvary Assembly. We're going to be exploring God's Word, learning how to discern the voice of God. You're going to want to take advantage of that opportunity. The second opportunity I want to invite you all to is our life groups. And life groups is where life transformation happens for so many people. And life groups are so important because it's in these environments where we develop authentic, real, transformative relationships where people can speak truth and love into our lives. It's open for anybody, no matter where you're at on your faith journey. We'd love for you to find out more by going to the Outdoor Welcome Center or by going to our website. We have a space for you. Fall ministry is starting this Wednesday. We can't wait to see you there. Come on guys, stop putting the logo over my face. <laughs> well, you can now see how we treat Giants fans around here. A safe place for everyone, unless you're a Giants fan, I guess, is how, how that goes. Uh, I wanted to take a moment and just celebrate the 52 people who accepted Christ's forgiveness here today. Can we give a big warm applause for them? Welcome home. We are so excited. What a, what a joyful day that this marks for your faith journey. I've got a few announcements for you that I want to make sure you catch here before um, we exit out of the tent. The first is that if this is your first or second time joining us here today, we are so glad that you have joined us here. We actually have a special gift for you. It's a Calvary Assembly mug, and this is, this is no joke of a mug. This is not like some little 12 ouncer. You can like eat soup out of this thing. So you're gonna wanna go ahead and grab that. That'll be at the Welcome Center. You can uh, grab that on your way out. And I do want to remind all the parents to pick up your kids. We, we, we aren't going to watch them for the next three hours. So um, after we exit the tent, if you want to head uh, directly into the classrooms, there's signs uh, to show you where to go. Um, if you have your little tag, that'll help the teachers pair up the kids to their parents. And if you lost yours, you can head to the Welcome Center and we can help you out with that as well. We are so excited to have bounce houses that are going to be starting up uh, just here in about 30 minutes. And uh, so you definitely wanna take advantage of that. For all the teenagers and college students, we are going to have a game called Nine Square that's going to be happening on the other side of the building. We are definitely looking forward to that. Steven, who was in that announcement video wearing Giants gear, brags about how good he is at Nine Square ad nauseum, so please, Humble him today, all of you teens. Um, let's see. So, um, oh, I also wanted to say thank you to all of our volunteers who helped make today great. We had 174 people help help welcome and help park and help who are going to help serve food. Would, yeah, would you say thank you to everybody who has made for an incredible day here today? If you have yet to pick up your physical tickets for the barbecue, you can head to the Welcome Center. And if you forgot to buy them ahead of time and you would like to, we have prepared an extra 100 meals for you. We have plenty of food for everybody. So just go ahead and, and again, head to that Welcome Center area and we can get you some tickets. They are priced at $8. And I had somebody taste test the food for me and they said, that is some of the best chicken I have ever tasted. Praise the Lord. All right. So we are, we are excited for that. So I um, am going to release you here in just a minute. And I would encourage you. I know we're a church who loves to talk and connect. And we want to encourage that. But if you can do that outside of the tent, that will help us take and clear this area so we can set up tables. And then we will get started with our food line. It's going to wrap around the tent like that. And then food's going to be served over there. You can wrap around and grab your drinks and beverages and come back in. We'll get started with that in about 20 minutes. Thank you guys for being a part of Family Fun Day. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills! <laughs>